What's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Investing Bros, the most generous crypto community out there here on YouTube. We got a great show lined up for you guys today because in case you're just waking up and you have not gone over to Twitter or a new site, CPI data came in lower than expected at 4.9%, but I did put over there in the poll and I want to see every single one of you guys vote on it. What do you think that means? Is this going to be bullish, bearish? Or was this a nothing burger? We're going to be talking about that and a whole lot more in this show. In case you guys haven't gone over to TradingView also, we are seeing almost everything in crypto pumping and the Dixie is falling. But we have a special guest today. Caleb Franzen is joining the show to give us his breakdown on what is happening, not just in crypto, but on the economic front as a whole. You guys know him. You love him. I cannot wait for this episode. But you guys need to make sure you go ahead and smash that like button and subscribe to the channel for all things crypto and stock market and everything you need to know so that you can invest for yourself not just listening blindly to other people but we want you to understand the market so you can invest for yourself and change your wealth forever we're gonna go ahead and jump in with our co-host this morning though before we bring caleb on we still have our opening for the show and that starts off with introducing the team mr t shroom the florida man how are you doing this morning well i'm doing better than i deserved him and you probably already knew that but i'm also coming off a fresh win over on Around the Blockchain, it was great to get the dub one by one point and uh, had a lot of fun over there. I do have a quote of the day. If you want to go over to my screen, it is from E.B. White. He said, hang on to your hat, hang on to your hope and wind the clock for tomorrow is another day. Tim, you've got a new hat. Tell us a little bit about that hat. Dude, shout out to Mr. Frankie Candles. A great Great channel. You guys got to go follow Frankie over there on Frankie Candles. B, great TA. And C, check out this hat. And, and shout out to his assistant, his his brand manager, Tony D. Uh, Tony is the man, the myth, and the legend, but he's also nice. real life. Uh, he, he like, makes these in the office. Like he's a, I want to get a blue one. He has, like, a, this tan and blue hat, um, but then he mints and puts that thing on there right there. I have to watch him make it. It's a beautiful-looking hat. Uh, go show support to Frankie. Love him very much. Uh, yeah. But what about Piper? Piper's here this morning. Mr. Texas, man. How are you doing this morning, Army Piper? Brother, I'm doing fantastic. I got into a long on Ethereum this morning before the CPI. So let's go. Yes. Let's go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you made a good choice. Guys, as we're sitting here, okay, uh, we're, this is going to be a little bit different of a stream. Go ahead and show my chart. Bitcoin is pumping up right now. It's up 2.4% on the day. Sitting here, coming back to the 0.236 level uh, at 28,300. This was very significant. I was going to show you guys this. I'll do it really quickly, and then we're going to jump back over and read some names, everybody. So uh, this is a different flow today. But I told you guys yesterday about this rising channel. Bitcoin, of course, bouncing right there perfectly. I wanted to show you guys Fibonacci too though over the next couple of coins because look at bitcoin didn't even drop back down if we're going back to opening this fibonacci level back on march 10th bitcoin didn't even make it all the way down to the 0.382 right now we're going to be wrestling with that 0.236 but as i thought I, this cpi data came in low and we're seeing a pump happen ethereum let's take a look at it it's pumping it has a little bit of a rising channel itself yes both of them had a little bit of a pop-up before but that was more of a fake out as a whole we're seeing rising trading channels on bitcoin and ethereum with those yellow flat boxes and sure enough we're getting a bounce there on ethereum uh not as much it's only up two percent so far but don't worry about it. It's going to be climbing here very soon. We're on the four-hour chart with this one. ADA, I told you guys, it bounced right here. Golden Pocket. That Golden Pocket mixed with, uh, we did have, we had a daily chart oversold, uh, but it went away this morning. So that's what happens when bullish price action. This morning, I put it on Twitter. You guys can go see the, the receipt on it. There was an oversold flash. Even though we technically are below the daily dynamic reactor here on Cardano, we had that nice Golden Pocket bounce. But you guys can see another, the pattern that Cardano's forming right now take off our Fibonacci is a little bit of a falling wedge. So we could get some bullish action coming here on Cardano. Either way, you guys can see just how overextended to the downside Cardano is because Bitcoin didn't even make it to 0.382. Uh, Ethereum wow. made it past 0.382, but did not quite make it to the 0.5. And then you have Cardano and I deleted it, but Cardano came here and bounced perfectly off that golden pocket. I'm seeing a lot of bullish action for crypto. This is kind of what I was expecting, but we'll talk more about that a little bit later. You can go ahead and go off my screen here, Piper. It is time, before we jump into some of this juicy content, bringing on Caleb Franzen and getting a breakdown of what this CPI data means, we got to do our ceremonial reading of the names. And I did, I, I, I don't have a notepad in here. I usually write down the first two 
names so I don't forget them. But my new technique is I text T Shroom. And, and so I got to read that text that I just sent him. I think the first commenter was Mr. J. Shout out to Mr. J for being first got that bot up and working this morning right behind him was a name i don't know do we have this name the other day that was in the top two bobby smoot was number two so congratulations to those two gentlemen uh we got some other names here though we got mr eric wallen is here crypto trades is here uh who else do we have poshis is here uh rick wilson in the building a mellow fellow Getting here a little bit late there, Mellow Fellow, but we still love you. Love having you here. Mike Play is here. Bob is here. Joe Nickel, Grand Roofing Incorporated. Poshius again said start already, guys. I guess he was just ready for the show. Listen, I love it. I love it, Poshius. I sometimes I wish we go early too, but like, man, we got to stick to our schedule. Keep order. Someday it'll pay off. You know what I mean? Uh, Crypto Pew Pew Cruz is here. Also, Justin Eubanks, Ninja Glock, John Con, Crux of Crypto with the Blue Wrench. Here's a name. I think I've read this name before, but it's been a minute. Tristan Allen is here. Welcome. We got Elo Brown is here. WM Crypto. I think that's a new name I have not read before. So welcome, WM. Uh, I'm not assuming that's a first name. Crypto JMP, JN Carr, Ryan McEachern. I don't think I said that correctly, but we're going to go with it. McEachern, Jenny from the blockchain, once again, saying nothing, Burger, so we know your vote. We'll talk about that poll here in a little bit. Brian D is here. Oh, here's a first name. Troy King, Territory Manager, Moose International. What a name. You get you get my hat. You know, I can't take off my hat because I my uh, headphones are over it, but hats off to that name for today. Ceremonial hats off. Uh, OBC is here. Lag is here. Max PP, Daniel J., Red Robles. Let's get a couple more here, and then we're going to jump in. Nancy Croy. I don't think I've ever read that name, so welcome, Nancy. Crimson Caravan Company. Mr. Gregory Gresick is here. And the last two, John Foster Crypto and Crypto Mini Bike. Thank you, every single last one of you. I think there's a couple of names I was not able to read, and I'm so sorry. It does not mean I don't love you. It's just time to go ahead and move on into this content. And before we bring on Caleb Franzen, let's start off with Army Piper's morning ritual, the reading nice. of the macroeconomic outlook. What are we looking at this morning, Piper, and what is coming over the next couple of days? Uh, no big news today. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. There's big news. Big news today, Tim. <laughs> Core inflation rate year over year. Uh, previously was at 5.6% from that 9.1% all-time high that we had last March. Consensus was that it was going to come in at 5.5, forecasted to come in at 5.6. We came in at 5.5 in line with consensus, only one-tenth of a percent down. So it's kind of meh bullish, uh, but uh, it, what, hey, I'll take bullish any day over bear. So uh, let's look at the inflation data uh, for year over year. We are now sitting at a 4.9%. Previously, we were at 5%. Just keep in mind, that's quite a bit below what our current Fed rate is right now. So remember, you want that Fed rate higher than inflation. So that's pretty good. Uh, did come in at forecast, uh, came in below the consensus on that. And then the inflation rate from month over month, we were a little bit higher this month than we were the previous month, uh, but it still came in line with the consensus a uh, little bit higher than the forecast. That's why I said it's a meh. But uh, if I jump over here and we throw it on to the uh, trueflation, Trueflation uh, printing this morning. Let me give a little refresh here because this might have changed. Nope, it didn't. There we go. So looking at Trueflation, it's coming in at 3.73, uh, which is quite a bit below uh, that 4.9 that, that we were showed uh, by the Fed Reserve. So going off nice. of the old methodology, even better. And typically this used to be worse than what the Fed was saying. And now we're seeing a little flip on that. So that is what we have there, Tim, coming in today on the macro economic news i'm going to kick it back over to you and i'm sure you've got some foc yeah. update for us we're yeah we're going to run through this really quickly because i want to get caleb on here really this morning i checked before the cpi data dropped this was actually sitting at 73 percent for a pause and so obviously that gives us a lot more we we had 27 percent saying that we we're going to rise by another 25 basis points but of course that data came in and we're shooting back up to 85 for right now so Still looking, we got a long time, we got over a month until we actually have the next FOMC meeting. But for right now, it still looks like we're on track for our pause. Really quickly, Bitcoin Fear and Green Index, if, 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 we're going to see it probably rise again today. But we did tick up one point yeah, uh, 
two days ago technically, but yesterday morning we talked about 51. It's now up at 52. Watch that change. In our new update, we're going to start talking to you guys about every single day until this no longer is a problem. The Bitcoin average transaction fee is down from yesterday. Of course, yesterday we broke $30 per transaction on average. This morning we're back down to $20.34. So that's a good sign. The Ethereum, after being up the other day all the way to 155, is back down to 103 guay. Uh, per average transaction. And, and, and we'll probably have to make a video talking about the math of that. Maybe Caleb knows the answer to that. Maybe not, though. Uh, but it, you should know that we have these transaction fees. Gas fees are down this morning, and that is a good sign. Go ahead and go off my screen here, Piper. And I am super excited. Normally, we get into technical analysis, and we're definitely going to do some more technical analysis, get some charts. But we are going to be joined this morning by Mr. Caleb Franzen, one of my favorite people. And I am not trying to pump him up or just be this nice host that get Caleb Franzen is one of my favorite people in all of crypto. I follow him. I read his Twitter posts religiously. I read his newsletter. If you do not, you're making a massive mistake with your crypto uh, investment journey. Caleb, how are you doing this morning or afternoon for you, I guess, right? It, yeah, it's uh, it's just in the, what time is it for me right now? It's uh, it's 311 um, nice. in the afternoon. Great to be here, guys. I've been really looking forward to this, especially um for cpi day it's gonna be a blast yes. so i'm doing well great to be here super pumped man i'm so excited to have you we're gonna kick this off just going right into 100 miles per hour 4.9 percent caleb what does this mean what should everybody know about this print a win is a win guys so um and let me apologize really quick because uh some construction started happening right before we went live so if there's a little bit of background noise i apologize um, yeah, look, you know, I've been pounding the table since we got the November 2022 data that we are in disinflation, right? So that was back in December of last year. And, you know, my expectation, my baseline has been that the shelter component of CPI will likely start to come down and decelerate between March and June of this year. And we actually saw. Oh, no. Oh, no. Did that construction get him? Uh oh, no. Hey. It's cliffhanger. Hopefully he'll be back here in just a second. Oh, that is fun. But you know That's what? We didn't get we didn't get to do a bunch of TA. So you guys need to stick around. Go ahead and smash that like button. Uh, how about this? A technical difficulty that wasn't on one of us. That's you know a breath of fresh air a little bit there. Can uh, you guys hear me? Get oh, there he yes. is. He's back. He's back. There you go. Dude, I, I don't I don't know what happened. I was uh I was mid rant and it just said you are no longer connected. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Listen, I, I was while you were gone, I was just saying it's like, man, that, that all of our followers know we've had our shares of technical difficulties, Wi-Fi problems and everything. Uh, we're on a little bit of a streak, but yeah, no problem. Our audience is used to it. Like they have these calluses. They just know when Wi-Fi goes bad, you just you just wait for a couple of minutes and it comes right back. But uh, yeah, continue on with what you're saying. Yeah, thanks. And I, I don't know what happened there, but, um, you know, so essentially <laughs> for the first time we've seen the shelter component come down. My expectation, I thought that the market was grossly overestimating what inflation was going to be on a year over year basis. So estimates going in were calling for 5%. That was exactly what we got year over year in the month of March. And if you remember from February to March, we fell from 6.0 down to 5.0%. So a massive decline in inflationary pressures. And so to expect that we would basically be flat relative to the prior month's data, I thought was, you know, a terrible prediction. And so I, you know, my baseline was to see 4.8% on a year over year basis. We came in higher than that. So, you know, I was wrong in my own prediction, but you know, the market in my opinion was, was, you know, like I said, grossly overestimating inflation. And so, you know, we continue to see evidence of peak used car prices uh, in terms of inflation. Uh, same with food. Now we're seeing that in shelter as well. Um, energy was deflationary year over year. So, you know, this is a great sign overall. And, um, mm -hmm. I, you know, I continue to be extremely fearful that the Fed is making future monetary policy decisions that take time to ripple through the economy using backwards looking data that is not representative <laughs> of what's actually happening even in the economy today, because shelter and OER is this figment of homeowners imagination. It's basically survey data, not real data. And so the fact that, you know, it makes up 33% of the overall CPI weighting basically shows us that the Fed is, they're, they're not looking in the rear view mirror. They basically have a telescope looking through the rear view mirror, right? And so they're, they're looking so far behind us that, you know, the risk of a policy mistake is growing increasingly um, substantial as, as they continue to, I mean, even if they pause rates, right? We're, we're at an effective federal funds rate now of 5.08%. 
Um, even if they pause, keep those rates there for three months, six months, I don't know how long those pressures are going to continue to ripple through because as a classic saying goes, monetary policy operates with a long and variable lag. We are quite mm. literally 14 months into the fastest monetary tightening cycle in US history. And we still need to grapple with all of those plus 0.75% rate hikes that happened last year. Those haven't mm. had their full impact on the economy. And the Fed just raised rates two weeks ago, right? Whenever it was last week, I don't even remember now. It, it's irrelevant though. That's kind of my point is whatever the Fed does here on out, we still need to deal with all of the policy decisions they've made yeah. going forward, right? So it, it's, it's, it's a very troublesome situation right now, in my opinion. All right, Caleb, live with me here in a dream world scenario, all right? So uh, Jerome Powell is fired. The youngest and smartest and most handsome new uh, person <laughs> sitting as chairman of the Fed, Mr. Caleb Franzen, is put in the spot. What's the move? What should the Fed be doing right now? What would your tactic and uh, strategy be to f continue to fight inflation but not cripple the U.S. economy? Yep. So uh, if Caleb had his wish and I had some control or voice at the Fed, um, first of all, I'd applaud them on the intervention that they've done in terms of the BTFP. And, you know, the Fed is supposed to act as the lender of last resort. And so with respect to the banking situation, they are doing that. If I was at the Fed right now, though, I would be voting most likely to cut rates by at least 0.5 percent, even as much as uh, 1 percent, um, because wow. as far as I'm concerned, we are in disinflation and we are actually at risk of encroaching on deflation, which is essentially the Fed's worst enemy. And so if they want to be true to their own goals in a lot of ways, I think that they need to be more forward thinking here. And so basically the, 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 the largest bright spot of the U.S. economy right now is the labor market. And the labor market is always the last thing to go. Every time we go into a recession, unemployment is at or near historic lows. That's where we are right now. And so the labor market is the is the last uh, domino to fall, if you will, before we formally enter a recession. So, so essentially to cite that, you know, oh, we have, you know, super strong, resilient, dynamic labor market. Yes, we do. But that is not representative of what the labor market is going to look like even one or three months from now. It could change on a dime by a dramatic amount. So if I had my wish, I would be voting um, to cut interest rates. We're already, even if we, even if we cut by 1%, right? We went down basically to an effective federal funds rate of four. That's still mm -hmm. historically high relative to where rates have been over the last 20 plus years. So it's still a, um, an aggressive monetary policy stance, just much less aggressive than it is in the current environment. Now, with that, because that's an interesting take there, you're not concerned at all, or what are your thoughts? Maybe you're waiting for it to happen before you have a whole reaction, but this talk about raising the debt ceiling and all the assumptions with all the bank failures, we're assuming that the money printer's going to be turned back on. Does that, at this point, that doesn't really concern you? You still think, even though that stuff could happen, we still should be back down to about you know 4 to 4.25 area for interest rates? If anything, the fact that we have this whole debate about whether or not the debt ceiling is going to be raised reaffirms my belief that we should be cutting interest rates because mm. if if right like th th that's essentially what needs to happen um first of all on the debt ceiling situation this is all political posturing 101 the debt ceiling if you look at the uh, at the chart historically it should it should really be called the debt floor um mm -hmm. because it just continues to get raised over time right we've never seen the debt ceiling come lower basically right <laughs> and, and if we have I, I can't even remember when that was um but you know when i have my great aunt calling me and asking me if she should be worried about her bond portfolio because of a potential default of the U.S. government, right? This is just essentially to store, excuse me, to stir some sense of fear, to express an urgency. But, you know, what are we doing? We're trying to borrow more money to pay off old debtors who are old lenders um, who were, you know, borrowed from to pay off even older debtors and lenders, right? So, you know, this is all just, it's a, it's a, it's a facade at its, at its best. And so, um, the debt ceiling thing for me is not really something I really have um, on too high on on my risk uh, radar, if you will. Um, okay. Sure, there's there's a non-zero chance that the that the government does not get this done, and there's you know a, a, a chance that you know there's some form of of default one way or the other. Um, but generally, I think that even if that scenario does happen, it will be resolved fairly quickly. 
Very, very interesting. Well, that's some good stuff there from the more macro economic front. Let's transfer into the world of crypto. So we have this, you know, we do, even though we're not going to get that rate cut just yet, we still got a 4.9% print. How are you seeing Bitcoin and crypto respond to this? Uh, like we said, we're up this morning. We did touch up to 28, almost 400, or not quite, to 28,330, I believe is where we kind of got to. We're a little bit down. We're back down to 28,100. But do you see that, do you see Bitcoin and crypto rallying over the next couple of days weeks of course we got the bitcoin conference coming up here in a little over a week and historically usually bitcoin rallies up into that conference and then crashes during or after but we also have that concept of sell in may walk away a lot of people thought that that's what this dip was doing what are your thoughts about the next couple of let's start with days maybe then weeks and then potentially the next couple of months where bitcoin and cryptos you keeping an eye on yeah, sure. So let me let me say this is I think from both a long, medium and short term perspective, um, objectively, when I look at these statistical indicators, when I look at the on chain data, it's all reflecting bullish dynamics. Um, so I can have all of my fundamental concerns and diagnose the risks related to the fundamental economy. But when I look at the statistical indicators, they're bu they're bullish. And so, you know, from that perspective, I, I also have to be bullish, right, just objectively. Um, and yeah. so for me, you know, one of the main things that I've really cited is both the 12 and 24 month Williams percent R oscillators leaving the lower bound or oversold area of that chart. And so Piper, if you can maybe flip over to my screen here, um, just very quickly, um, are you guys able to see, uh, yep, this chart we got here? You. We got you. perfect. So this is Bitcoin with the 12 month Williams percent R oscillator. And you could see every time we've left this over, uh, excuse me, this lower bound oversold, uh, level. That's essentially marked the lows of the cycle and we're off to the races. And so this crossover happened in January. And by the way, I was warning when we crossed below this level in, uh, I think it was in May of last year or June of last year saying, hey, look, we're entering a statistical accumulation zone. And this is, you know, it could indicate that there's certainly going to be more pain ahead. But I think for long term investors who still have undying, if you will, commitment or conviction in Bitcoin, the asset and the monetary network, this is a buying opportunity. And so since we've left that zone, I have to be more bullish. If you look at something like the 24 month Williams percent oscillator, so the, the two year analysis that left the oversold level in March. So again, you know, we've continued to kind of check these boxes off if you uh, and you could stop any my uh, sharing my screen here. Um, if you, you know, like from an on chain basis, right? Uh, price is now above the short term holder realized price since January of this year. We're also above the long term holder realized price, which happened shortly thereafter. And now the short term holder realized price is trading above the long term holder realized price. So we have price above short term holder realized price, which is also above long term holder realized price. Statistically, it doesn't get too much more bullish than that from an on chain perspective. And so when I look at those things, you know, I think you have to be quite bullish. I wouldn't, you know, I think one of my baseline expectations here is to see a decline into the $25,300 range. That's kind of a baseline for me. Why that level? It's the 200 week exponential moving average, right? So there's a lot of price memory there. It's also right now where the short term holder realized price is trading. So there's a lot of price memory there. Um, and, you know, essentially, I think Bitcoin's up, what, like 70% year to date. So, you know, we should expect to see a little bit of a cool down here. But, you know, seeing a retest of that 200 week moving average, even the 200 day moving averages, um, the short term holder realized price. If we get those declines, which would basically be, you know, three thousand to five thousand dollar decline for Bitcoin, I'd still relatively be bullish in that environment because we're testing proven levels of dynamic support. And so if we fall below those levels, I'll get bearish. We're not there yet. So I'll be bullish. Mm -hmm. That's a that's a good take. Now, uh, here on the Investing Bros channel, I've been pretty open and honest with my audience. I believe that we're going to have somewhat of a repeat of 2019 with a, what, what I call a premature bull run. So that doesn't mean bull market just yet. We're not ready to explode and go test new highs. But I, I've said before, and I'm, I'm getting a little cautious. My it's, it's taking longer than I wanted to, but I called for maybe as high as 50,000 before maybe a 25% dip. I was also, I think you said 25,200, 300, that range. I, I believe we could see a good little rally. Maybe it doesn't quite get to 50. Maybe it only gets to between the 36,000 to $42,000 range and then a dip back down. What are... 
are you thinking about this in shorter terms? Are you only kind of thinking about longer terms? I, I love the chart you just showed, which I got I to gotta look at that more. I've never used that indicator before. But as I was showing, like it didn't necessarily start every bull market, but it definitely showed the sign of the bearish nature coming to a close. What are your thoughts about the rest of this summer for Bitcoin and crypto? Are you, are you thinking that we're entering a bull market or are you kind of in agreement? This is kind of a pre-bull market rally, a premature rally that's not necessarily the official bull market just yet. So I think we could get, I, I, I wouldn't get as overzealous to say into the $50,000 range. Um, mm. But, you know, from the analysis that I've done, I think getting to, you know, 42 to 45,000 is a fairly reasonable target if these bullish dynamics persist, right? If, for, for example, imagine the Fed continues to thread the needle here. Um, maybe a couple more banks go under, um, but we don't have kind of a widespread um, loss of deposits. Disinflation continues to be the name of the game. You know, they start to pause, right? This, that, and the other. The economy slows down, but we don't see a material pickup in unemployment, right? Like think of the perfect scenario here in terms of the fundamental economy. I think generally that that would be bullish for all risk assets and even bonds, for example. So, um, you know, in that environment, which is, is possible, I wouldn't say it's probable, um, but it is possible. Um, you know, Bitcoin would do extremely well in that environment, particularly if some, some more banks fail, right? Because what we've seen as yeah. these bank failures occur is we're seeing capital essentially leave the fundamental traditional financial system. And it basically reaffirms the uh, overall bullish thesis of Bitcoiners, right? And so these bank failures are basically continuing to highlight and run a marketing or advertising campaign for Bitcoin. Um, and so if those failures continue to occur, which is generally my base case, to be quite honest, but the Fed's intervention with BTFP, the FDIC stepping in, maybe they raise uh, the limit on insured deposits, so on and so forth. This would all be very bullish for Bitcoin, just fundamentally, mm -hmm. right? It's just, it's that simple. And so I, you know, I, I, I could definitely see an environment where we continue to have Bitcoin bid higher. And in that environment, right, one of the things that, you know, we're talking about here is the, you know, the 200 week moving averages, the 200 day moving averages, short term holder realized price. If the price of Bitcoin continues to trend higher, those indicators and statistical levels are also going to trend higher, basically meaning that our dynamic support levels are going to be moving higher. And there's no guarantee that those dynamic support levels work. They're potential support for a reason, not certain support, right? But, you know, if those floors are rising, essentially, that basically continues to reaffirm the bull case. So, you know, as far as I'm concerned, right, these indicators are all sloping upwards now. They have a positive slope. This is bullish, right? This is, this is structurally bullish. Yeah. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And again, I, I'm, I think you and I are the same kind of mind too. Like uh, Bitcoin, it's just really important to pay attention to Bitcoin right now. There will be a season where Bitcoin gets maybe a little more boring and other coins are going off. But right now, Bitcoin is very important. But let's let's shift into crypto for a little bit. Before we get into the stock world with T-Shroom, and I know you're going to be able to have a lot of insight there as well. What altcoins are you keeping an eye on? We'll, we'll even, I'll even open it up. You can go wherever you want to go with this. Are there any meme coins that Caleb Franz is interested in? Of course, right now, the craze over the last couple of days, the last week or so, has been meme coins. Are you a meme coin guy? If yes or no, you can answer that. And then cryptos. What, what are your thoughts about other cryptos you're excited about? And what is your plan on when to get more maybe aggressive getting into altcoins uh, rather than just sticking maybe into Bitcoin? Maybe like Ethereum's still an altcoin, but like, sometimes I'm, I'm starting to kind of treat Ethereum like, more like Bitcoin, where it's like, hey, those are just the two big ones. You always going to want to be paying attention to those ones, but then other altcoins are more speculative. What are your thoughts about that whole uh, the whole altcoin world right now? Yeah, you know, I, I'd absolutely agree with your take there on Bitcoin and Ethereum. You know, my my thesis in Bitcoin is very different than my thesis in Ethereum, right? So, but that doesn't necessarily invalidate one or the other. And so, I think a lot of Bitcoiners, which I would um, generally describe myself as, um, you know. I don't know. They don't seem to acknowledge that quite so much. And so when I look at the altcoin space in general, I think, you know, layer ones are always going to be um, exciting because as far as I'm concerned, really smart people are working on really innovative um, products and services on the blockchain. Do I know which one is going to win? Do I know which one is going to deliver the most value um, fundamentally? No, I don't. Right. And so, you know, maybe, you know, it's it's permissible, I would I would think, to move slightly out onto the risk curve if you already have sufficient exposure to Bitcoin and Ethereum, um, you know, and, and maybe have, I would say no more than 10% of a portfolio um, in the altcoin universe, right? You know, outside of Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, 
some of these flyers perhaps on, on Chainlink or Polygon or Avalanche, I think is quite exciting, even though I don't have any exposure or something like Cosmos and Atom, you know, these are, you know, basically essentially the way I see it are, you know, blue chip uh, layer one pro uh, projects um, mm -hmm. that are, you know, basically fintech companies. Um, they're, 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 excuse me, they're certainly not um, hard money by, by any stretch of the imagination, right? But, you know, uh, just because something is not hard money doesn't mean that there can't be innovation there. Um, the same way yeah. that, you know, you know, I'm buying Google stock, I'm buying Microsoft stock, I'm buying Amazon. I'm not making investment decisions purely based on, is this hard money, right? <laughs> you know, so that, that's, that's kind of how I view things there. Nonetheless, because they are so volatile, um, they're essentially leveraged exposure to both Bitcoin and Ethereum. And, you know, my general um, outlook on both Bitcoin and Ethereum is that these investments are going to do extraordinarily well over time, right? So um, I don't necessarily need leverage on those positions in order to have substantial payouts 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now, right? However long that may take. And so mm. that's why I generally say, you know, having exposure to some of these layer ones that I just mentioned, um, you know, you really don't need much more than five or 10%. And in my opinion, anything beyond that is extremely excessive. Very good. What, last question I have for you. What about, uh, maybe you mentioned it for somebody I didn't hear it. What are your thoughts on SUI? That's one of the new tokens out, new layer one. Uh, I don't know if you've done any research into SUI, but that's supposed to, that's one that I think could have a nice bull run. Um, of course, it's the former team for Meta. Um, they're working to solve a lot of problems that other layer ones had trouble with. Do you have any opinion on SUI or is that one that you really haven't dug too much into yet? I literally have done zero research on that. Um, okay. I will say we'll though, as an, observ <laughs> as an observer of crypto, right? Uh, some of these pumps are very narrative based and narrative driven, right? And so what we've mm -hmm. seen with something like Aptos or Arbitum, this, that, and the other, you kind of have these, uh, I don't want to say manic pumps, but in a lot of ways, you know, in a lot of ways, it's not surprising to see those dynamics take place. And so sure, could SUI be, you know, the next, the next thing to go? Yeah, you know, there's a chance, but you know, again, I've done absolutely zero research on it. I'm certainly not going to, um, uh, like, I, I have no outlook on this thing, you know. But I'm just, you know, simply saying that as an observer of crypto for years and years and years, you know, it's yeah. very narrative based. And so, if there's a, if there's excitement around it, you know, it's possible that you know it could, you know, do its thing. So we'll see. Sweet. Well, guys, we're going to transition here. We're about to get into stocks. Just going to give you a rundown for the rest of today's show because it is a little bit different. Getting Caleb on, this is awesome. I don't know if we'll have time, but if you guys have any questions you want to ask Caleb, uh, there's a chance we might have a couple of minutes at the end. We can ask Caleb some questions. Uh, so go ahead and be putting those in the comment section. We're going to do a quick little stock market open with T-Shroom and Caleb. They're going to get their thoughts there. And then we have some stories. In case you guys are looking at that title, maybe some of you guys are like, wow, like great show. I'm loving it. I'm, I want to smash that like button right now because maybe some of you haven't because there's a, over 100 people watching, only 65 likes. So there's a lot of people need to do that. But uh, if you're wondering why is Bitcoin confiscation coming, we're going to be talking about that. That's going to be our main story we're going to talk about here in just a couple of minutes. So stay tuned. I want to get uh, Caleb's thought on that as well. But T-Shroom, I'm going to throw it over to you. What is the stock market doing? And I'm very interested to hear what Caleb thinks. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and uh, start off on my screen. Guys, not a shocker here. We had the CPI beat. And as you can see here, the indexes are coming in green. NASDAQ is loving it overall uh, up 1%. And then the Dow Jones up 0.5 and the S&P up 0.8. So they're all kind of predictably in line there, but all green. So very, very good. You're seeing green across the board there in crypto all the way across the board. And I think our market leader from my watch list is AGIX. Uh, Gal is doing pretty well getting bought. Adam. So these are some of the names that are getting slaughtered, guys. Absolutely destroyed. And uh, now folks that are looking to invest in crypto, they're buying up those names. And so maybe it's something I'm going to be doing a little bit later. Something you might consider as well. Uh, coming back up to energy, energy down. Energy down across the board there. Natural gas uh, down about more than 2%. And then oil coming down again. Another down day for oil down 0.7%. We're going to go and check out Pepe is down 2.5% for those of you who care. Uh, moving on into the metals, silver is up 0.5%, gold getting sold off, but just barely probably is going to close the, the day green there for gold. Your mega cap tech stocks coming across green across the board. Of course, that's what we'd expect. Saw the NASDAQ up 1% there. Your leader on this watch list, Tesla up 2.6%. Amazon up 2.3%. Uh, your boy T Shroom caught a little bit of Amazon today when he saw, uh, actually it was before the C. Thank you, Piper. Before the CPI print, so 
that was my CPI play because, hey, if the CPI was a miss, at least I'm holding Amazon, right? And not something uh, not something crazy. All right, so uh, that is going to be kind of where I want to ask the questions to Caleb. But before we do, let's go ahead and finish out this watch list. Cannabis green, mid-cap tech stops green. Jenny coming up again, had a 15% to the upside day yesterday, up 4% today, wanting to come back for more of that green, baby. Big banks coming in green across the board and your oil producers are mixed. So let's go back. Let's talk about bonds, Caleb. Why, uh, we've been seeing the the yield curve trying to correct here. Uh, the two-year is down below 4%. The 10-year benchmark is uh, at 3.4 and the 30 years at 3.8. Um, what have you been observing in the bond markets? Are things moving in the right direction? Um, are they, do you feel like that they're, they're, uh, in need of a reprice in one direction or another? And just generally, what are your thoughts on bonds and what they're telling us about the market? So I think it, it all depends on the duration or the maturity of the bond that we're talking about, right? So as you, as you properly pointed out, what we're seeing is substantial and massive declines in the two year, the five year, the 10 year, the 30 year, so on and so forth. What we're not seeing those substantial declines in are the one month, three month and six month treasury yields. In fact, they've actually been moving higher um, and they're mm. basically trading right now at year to date highs. And so a lot of this has to do with what's happening with the debt ceiling and that whole conversation. But generally what's what the market is telling me is, you know, basically since December, I've been saying dismiss what the two years is, is telling us. And the new arbiters of truth are the three month and six month yield. And so right now, the six month treasury yield is trading at five point one five percent, you know, I think the last time it was around there was back in you know 2007, um, if my memory is correct. And so from my perspective, what we're seeing here in the short duration uh, treasury yields is that bond investors don't yet believe that the Fed is going to reverse course. And it's interesting because, you know, when, when people cite, um, you know, Fed funds futures or the market's expectations of rate cuts, Quite simply, you know, the bond market is not reaffirming that because if, if, if the market was pricing in rate cuts over the next six months, the six month treasury yield would be much lower. Um, and it's just simply not the case. Um, so until we start to see a material decline in the three month and the six month treasury yield, I expect to see monetary policy remain in a very aggressive stance. Whether that means another hike or a pause for the next six months, to me, like I said kind of earlier, it, it's somewhat irrelevant. Um, in terms of the, of, of the market impact, because we still need to reckon with all of the rate hikes that have essentially been done over the course of the last 14 months. Um, I will say um, last week, I did go out and buy a bunch of um, short-term uh, treasuries uh, via ICSH. It's the BlackRock Ultra Short Duration um, Treasury Fund. Uh, there's another one from Vanguard VGSH. I bought a substantial amount of that as well. So these are, you know, extremely short duration, uh, like basically less than six months, um, as far as I know, for the duration on those bonds. And I also went ahead and I went on the ultra long end. So I bought something ZROZ. Um, it's a 25 plus year zero coupon uh, treasury. And so, you know, I think right now as these yields on the ultra short end, um, are still very elevated rest, uh, relative to the rest of the curve. That's basically a massive opportunity. Um, in addition to the money market funds that are, you know, I have a substantial amount in right now. Um, and so, you know, the treasury market is certainly interesting. We're seeing a little bit of, um, I don't want to say uh, discrepancy between the data points, but it just, it shows us what bond investors are expecting to see over different timeframes. And I think mm -hmm. generally um, th those views are aligned with my own. Okay. Awesome. That's that's a really good response. Um, I, I think I think I agree with you. And I just added the three and six month to my watch list so that we can be keeping an eye on that as well. Uh, that's a that's a really good addition to, to bring to the table here. Well, uh, circling back into the tech mega cap tech stocks, uh, we already mentioned Amazon and Google. Uh, Apple just had some crazy good earnings. Uh, we, I was not expecting uh, good earnings for tech. You know that that's something that the the media was trying to push would not be the case, and yet that's exactly what we got. So, how important was that earnings season that we just got through um, for a bullish narrative in 2023 and moving into 2024? Well, what's important to remember here is that the market reaction to earnings is all relative to expectations, not you know, the results on an absolute basis are in a vacuum. 
right? And so, for example, I, you know, I've been posting about how I, I generally thought that Apple's report was bullish and, you know, the market agrees with me. And some of these people are responding to me, whether it's in DMs or publicly on Twitter saying, oh, well, they had revenue growth of negative 3%. So that's bearish. Well, if the market was expecting revenue, uh, Apple's revenue to decline by 10% and it actually comes down as negative 3%, that's much better than what the market was already pricing in, right? And so that's essentially what we're seeing is, is the market's reaction action to earnings is always relative to expectations, not relative to on absolute terms. So it's been a stronger than expected earnings season, even though we've certainly seen earnings slow down, right? That's the key mm -hmm. thing. And so after, you know, really bad, I would say Q4 results for the overall market of last year. Um, I think that in a lot of ways, uh, analyst expectations got overly bearish. And so the market was priced based on those bearish analyst expectations. And so as we kind of come in stronger than those expectations, the market gets repriced to the upside. And so, you know, even before earnings, we've seen the market be led by mega cap tech, right? One of my favorite things to look at, Teach Room, I remember going, coming on the show once uh, and it was just you and I, and I was telling you about NY Fang, right? It's the New York Stock Exchange Fang Plus Index, N N Y F A N G is the ticker symbol. And this is hitting new year to date highs today. I think it was up more than 1.5% uh, when I checked the chart earlier this morning. And so it's an equal weight basket of 10 mega cap tech stocks, right? So you have uh, Amazon, you know, all the big names in there, right? So um, this yeah, it's is in premium, right? certainly go to my screen, Piper, if you could continue, continue, Caleb. I'm sorry. I just wanted to pull it up because oh, I've got it here. Yeah, no, this is an interesting chart for sure. Um, and, you know, we're seeing bullish dynamics here, it, you know, back in February, Microsoft broke out of a multi-year bull flag. We're seeing the same thing take place for Apple over the last two weeks. And these are the two largest and therefore most important stocks in the entire world. Right. And, you know, if you're, it's basically like if you have Steph Curry and LeBron James on the same team and they're, you know, putting up 40 points each, your team is probably going to win. Right. Even if the role players and the bench aren't really scoring that much, the team is going to win. So the same analogy applies for the stock market. Right. That's why I'm bringing it up. And so when the best stocks in the world and the most important stocks in the world are displaying bullish behavior, that's bullish for the overall market. And people can complain about it all they want. And if you are complaining about it, my only question to you is, well, then why don't you own the best stocks? Right. Yep. So it, it's really it's really that simple. Um, my general expectation, you know, is I've become uh, significantly less bearish relative to my expectations at the beginning of the year, even though fundamentally all of my econ outlook has come to fruition. The market's expectation to those results has been significantly different than I've been expecting and calling for. And so when we've had significant improvements from a price structure perspective, from a technical analysis perspective, from an indicator perspective, I have to respect what those signals are telling me. And so my, my general expectation here is, you know, with mega cap tech performing so well, that's basically like Bitcoin and Ethereum performing extremely well. And what you start to see is once investors get comfortable with those results, they start to move further out onto the risk curve, further out onto the right. spectrum of risk. So we might see that follow through in overall tech and therefore in consumer discretionary and therefore into small caps and so on and so forth, right? So we might see that ripple effect now start to take place over the coming months, so long as, key thing here, so long as everything is relatively under control uh, from a macroeconomic perspective. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, the, the alarm bells ringing in my ears are kind of pointing to Coinbase, right? For our audience who loves crypto, Coinbase is further out on the risk curve. And that thesis is becoming more and more validated the higher that Amazon and Microsoft goes. All right. Well, let's go ahead and do a pivot here, uh, Tim, unless you wanted any, if you had any questions for Caleb on any other subject, we can go ahead and do a hard pivot here into the stories and skip the promos yeah. for the day. Yep. All right, let's do it. So do it. right now on, on my screen, we've got the UK tax authority consider seizing crypto from businesses. So this is the confiscation uh, thumbnail reference here. This is over in the UK. They're getting a little crazy. Uh, the UK tax authority expects 12 million from individual crypto taxes. Uh, the revisions to their current tax laws uh, that are pointed at crypto uh, proposed in new consultation paper would allow the HMRC, I believe that's the equivalent of their IRS, to access custodial wallets and PayPal accounts. Uh, so while crypto exchanges cannot stop user inflows, they can prevent users from cashing out funds to fiat or transferring them to another wallet. Really, really important uh, backstops there for uh, for wallets there, things to be aware of, especially in the UK. The government will consult 
wallet operators to develop the proposal and understand implementation changes. The HRMC, again, the UK's IRS, collected 787 billion pounds. Uh, that's mm -hmm. 900. That's almost a. That's almost a. Uh, that's 994 billion in the last tax season. So I want to throw it to Tim. I want to throw it to you first because you actually discovered this. This story is kind of flying under the radar today. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm sure you'll see it around, but but this did not pop up my screen. So Tim, you saw it first. What is your take yep. on this? And then and then you can throw it to whoever's take you want to get. I want I want to start off because the, one of the reasons this even flew on my radar this morning is because I know how many fans we have here at the Investing Bros that are from the UK. So if you are a UK bro, uh, put a one in chat. I want to see you guys represent. Um, but some of our some of the most engaging people we have over in our Discord are from the UK. So this, of course, will affect them the most. And then, of course, there's some of us who probably use a VPN uh, over in the UK as well. Ultimately, this story is it's a there's a simple lesson to pull away, and that is not your keys, not your crypto. Get your money, get your Bitcoin, get your crypto off of centralized exchanges and get them into cold wallets. Uh, this article talks about it. You know, they already confiscate if they think there's any type of criminal activity. Uh, but but here's the thing. like, I don't know how many of you guys are on taxes. And to be fair, I don't know if taxes go the same way in the UK as it does in the United States. But I definitely have been involved in times where I played and did everything I was supposed to do. And there's a disagreement between me and the IRS about how many tax, how much taxes I actually owe. At least it's still my money, and then I get to have that conversation with the IRS. Let's say this came to the United States, and now the IRS just decides to go into my wallet and take my crypto because it believes that I owe more on it. Uh, and guess what? The IRS does not fully understand crypto just yet, so they could – for some weird reason, think they're entitled to a lot of my crypto. I do not want their fingers in my wallet. Therefore, this, again, it's not affecting us just yet. This isn't the American IRS being able to do this. But if I was in the UK, this would just be that kind of nail in the coffin. Hey, the majority, I'm talking about 80 to 90% at least of my crypto portfolio is sitting yep. in a cold wallet. I might have a small trading portfolio and I might take some stuff out to do some moves really quickly on a centralized exchange, but I'm not going to just let it sit there while I walk away and go about my normal life. I want as little of my crypto on a public exchange as possible, just in case. Again, I don't know what, the, maybe you said, Tishan, what this agency is called. Just in case they wake up and decide, you know what? Let's get some more crypto today. Let's tell, let's, let's say that they owe us more taxes. And, and that's never happened before in history. The government just deciding that you owe more taxes for you. Uh, so this would have to be a first. You know, uh, I don't want to yeah. I don't want to roll the dice on that. This is something that's very, very important. If you do not, if you've been thinking about it for a long time, getting a cold wallet and have been putting it off. If you're in the UK, today is the day. Go buy a cold wallet. Get your crypto off public exchanges. Yeah, well, I actually want to go ahead and move on because we've got two more juicy stories. Um, okay. So let's skip ahead. And, and Piper, I want to I want to hear what you have to say about this next one. The headline is President Joe Biden critiques wealthy crypto investors on Twitter. And here is the tweet, guys, this is official messaging from your commander in chief. He says, we don't have to guess what MAGA House Republicans value. They're telling us. And this is the graphic that they've generated. It says, we think Congress should cut tax loopholes that help wealthy crypto investors. Uh, and then it says some other stuff about MAGA Republicans. But the the White House official messaging is calling out uh, wealthy crypto investors. So kind of putting them in a category of the bad guy. So Piper, I want to throw it to you. How how egregious is this? How 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 much of an attack, an aggressive attack and assault on the crypto community is this to say this is who they want to go after and kind of play them as the bad guy? So, <laughs> uh, choose your words wisely, Army Piper. Um, so <laughs> I'm just saying, man. So here's my issue with all of this. Here's my issue with all this. Of all the things that you could have picked to start a fight in the debate against the other side, why crypto again? Because let's be honest, Sleepy Joe, you had all three parties, your party or all three branches. Your party has had all three branches multiple times. If you wanted to close tax loopholes, you would have done it a long time ago, but you wouldn't do that because 99% of all of your funds is coming from the rich people that use the tax holes. You guys don't change. All of this talk is a bunch of BS, and I'm tired of hearing it from all these politicians about what you want to do on your policy platform and agenda. But when you have all three branches, you sit on your hands. Shut up and get out of office. I'm done yeah. there. 
Hey, uh, T-shirt. Right. Uh, I think next up, choose a topic that Piper cares about so that we can yeah. get some life out of him. <laughs> Maybe uh, get him to open up a little bit about his views. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that was great, Piper. All right, next story here uh, up. And Caleb, obviously, I want to get your impact, your uh, your kind of take on this. I commented it on it yesterday, and this was a my commentary was winning commentary on Around the Blockchain, I'll point out. Uh, but here's the next story. Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, and other partners in new blockchain network. This is pretty big news, guys. The Canton Network will be a privacy-enabled interoperability blockchain network aimed at those working with institutional assets. It will allow the synchronization of financial markets that were previously siloed, mean kept out of the blockchain uh, networks. Uh, participants in the network currently include PNB, Parabras, CBEO, Global Markets, Digital Assets, uh, Paxos, Microsoft, Goldman Sachs, Deloitte, and others. Uh, and then the big takeaway here is the tokenization of real world assets may offer an unprecedented opportunity to create new market infrastructure and drive efficiency in the trading of products across the globe. Well, guys, we just got a positive CPI print today. The market is reacting bullish. Uh, Caleb, in light of all of this, I want to get your take. Do you think that this headline is going to be bullish for crypto or do you think that this is the beginning of the end and that the the big institutions here are trying to shut it down and take it over no they're, they're not trying to shut it down and take it over um you know they're just they're trying to get some skin in the game right they see an opportunity here um and they see a chance over the over the long run to create value on something here right and so you know this whole aspect of tokenization and securitization of you know real world assets um isn't anything new you know, it's been, you know, talked about and discussed. And so to see kind of a follow through in terms of actual activity and funding and whatever the case is, like, I have no idea what the hell they're working on. Uh, but, you know, those those were some pretty big institutions that you named there, um, including my former employer, employer BNP Paribas. Um, so that's interesting. Um, yeah, I mean, I, 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 like, I don't know when that announcement came out. It's, it's news to me. Um, but, you know, yes, clearly, I think the market is OK. Yeah. So I think in a lot of ways, you know, the market has kind of gotten immune to these types of um announcements which is funny kind of in and of itself most likely you know if these announcements came out five six seven years ago um everything would be up 20 percent, right and so in a, in a lot of ways i think more, more so than anything else it really just shows how far the industry has come where you know announcements like this of you know traditional innovative companies stepping in to get involved in blockchain and you know whatever the hell is going on that you know it's kind of just swept under the rug in a lot of ways and it's you know it's not really market moving information right yesterday crypto was down um, and so, you know, it's like, uh, I don't know, those are my yep. thoughts there. So, you know, yep. we'll, we'll continue to see major announcements like this over the, over the next six months, two years, five years, 10 years, hundred mm percent. -hmm. Absolutely. Well, Tim, mm -hmm. what are your thoughts on this? Uh, do you feel like this is going to be kind of encroachment into, you know, the DeFi and, you know, names like AVAX and Solana and Cardano that have really forged ahead and pioneered, you know, the, the crypto network or, is is this a, should we welcome you know these big tradfi and traditional names with open arms as they're going to bring a lot more institutional adoption they're going to they're definitely going to bring institutional adoption and, and so for that way the, for that purpose the price Prices could be benefited. Uh, here's the thing, though. I think there will always be a desire for the more decentralized part of this. I think there's always going to be that desire for DeFi. Uh, could this potentially muffle and stifle things like what you said, the other layer ones, a little bit, maybe? But I still see, I still see those growing uh, very much. So I still see those growing a lot in the future. And like, for, for example, Cardano, uh, the United States Cardano community. You know, I don't know. I don't know what Cardano's impact in the United States is going to be. But we're talking about what it's doing over like in the likes of Africa and down in South America and things like that. Uh, that is where it's going to do its damage. Cardano's not an American coin. Like Americans like it for price action, although they don't like it recently because it's been boring mm -hmm. and kind of depressing. But we're talking about use case scenario. Africa and South America are in love with Cardano because of the amazing decentralized aspect of it. That's not going to change just because these big boys are getting in the space. Yep. The, yep. If anything, those things, they'll just add to the price action. Yep. Yep. And remember, guys, crypto is not American. It may be news to you yeah. if you're a, a hardcore patriot with a with an American centric worldview. That's OK. Keep that up, baby. We love the patriotism. But crypto is the world's new network. Well, Piper, go ahead and wrap us out. Give us a, your view on this big development as Microsoft partners up with Paxios and Deloitte and other big names to uh, to expand the, the crypto network here. 
uh, wrap us out of the news and then we'll go ahead and give Caleb an opportunity to tell us how folks can follow up with him. I don't think it's horrible. I don't think it's a horrible thing. Here's why. Because, and I'm going to segue back from my rant that I just got off of. Uh oh. Big institutions are big money that pay all those politicians that want to talk out their butts instead of their mouth nice. with their in brains. So at the end of the day, that is going to bring in some people that are going to grease the palms of the politicians to get the heck off of the crypto markets back. I mm. it, they're not going to be able to just completely eliminate it. Um, if, if you've got Microsoft, Bill Gates over there going, Hey, uh, Pelosi, you remember me last uh, election? Let's, let's go ahead and, uh, take care of my crypto investment here too. So I don't think it's going to be a horrible thing. I think, uh, the more of those institutional people that are, uh, institutions that are into this and corporations that are into this, the more of those, uh, dirty behind the door, closed door, uh, deal makers are going to fight to keep it relevant. So, um, not, not necessarily right. a bad thing. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. I, I didn't give my view, but you can guess, guys. And I gave it on around the blockchain. I'm bullish. I think this is a positive story for crypto. I think there's some things to watch. Yeah. But um, yeah. So, Tim, why don't you go ahead and, uh, Was, you know, let folks Hold on. Know time out. Ta time out. Was that the ATB that you won? It was. And oh, my, oh, I'm a four-time oh, nice. winner. Almost nice. a five-time winner. <laughs> uh, but we won't get into the, the into that. T-shirt, uh, I, I have a video idea that I think we could make. And, and I think our community would get a kick out of it. I think you need to make a tutorial on how to win around the blockchain. What is the tactic, the skill set? It'll get, it'll get a lot of views for the other influencers, uh, because you yeah. seem to have the in you, you understand yep. the, the how it you, works they, very nicely. So the key is to have a background, a strong background in public speaking. I was in mm. uh, model United nations in college, all four years, an award-winning delegate, I will point out. Uh, and I had a lot of fun. So basically, what the, what it thank you, thank you, well deserved. Uh, <laughs> no, basically, what it teaches you is how to be a lawyer. It, it teaches you how to get up there and filibuster. That's that's really the skill is to just speak and like uh, and filter thoughts and like organize them uh, so that you can just have have no end to what you're going to say. Similar to that mm. sentence that I just uh, unleashed on our audience just then. But um, yeah, so so that's a good idea though, Tim. That's a really good idea for a video. I, I think it'd be um, a, I think it'd be a good piece of content. Well, as we're as we're wrapping up, I, I want because we're gonna, I'm going to ask Caleb another question. I kind of saw a couple people in chat kind of uh -oh. mentioning, uh, but but while we still have people here, a good amount of people here, make sure go to the description down below. You guys see? Well, go back to the go back to our bro cam real quick because you guys can see Caleb Franzen's Twitter handle. You see all of our Twitter handles right there. So if for some reason you're not Twitter? following any of us, go follow all four of us, but specifically Caleb Franzen. Uh, go follow him right now. Also, you'll see in the description down below, you'll see a link to his, uh, his newsletter. And so he has a free version. He has a paid version. Highly recommend at least at least get the free version. You're not going to regret it. And then when you see the content there, consider subscribing. Uh, that is how he's here as an influencer. Show him support because he is essential to the crypto space. Uh, Caleb, question I have for you, though. A couple of you are asking. Uh, how, you're in Budapest right now. How is Europe? What is your plan? Give us a quick rundown because it's been a minute since you were here. You're, you've been in Europe now for how long? And what are the countries you've been in? And where are you planning on going after this? Yeah, so I officially kind of started my digital nomad journey um, exa almost exactly two months ago. Um, I flew out to Croatia, I think it was on March 7th or something like this. Um, nice. So I spent a month in Dubrovnik. I spent a month in Split, Croatia. I had a chance to go down to Montenegro for a couple of days, check it out down there. Uh, but, you know, I'm still working full time, probably more now than ever. Um, <laughs> It's just, you know, I'm, I'm out here in Europe, so it's been a lot of fun. I'm in Budapest right now. I arrived last week. This is one of the most picturesque, beautiful cities. I've never seen architecture quite like this. It's just, it's, it's, you can just walk around for hours. It's like, I'm in, I'm not in like a great neighborhood by any means. It's super safe, but like right across the street, it's like people's homes, like their windows have like pillars and columns and like, you know, just these like sculptures of like gargoyles and angels and, you know, these intricate, it's just unbelievable. It's like the most simple yeah. buildings have better architecture than in the us you know it's just it's it's absolutely crazy so the food is amazing the people are extremely extremely kind um english is very well spoken so it's been a blast being out here i'm gonna have to leave the eu for immigration purposes uh at the beginning of june so i'll be going to turkey mm. for a couple of months before i return back but you know i'm continuing to do the whole digital nomad thing and i'm really not sure when i'll be returning to the states for now so you know we'll see are you gonna make your way to dubai at any point 
Um, look, I would love to. Um, it's just a matter of, of when and why. Um, you know, gotcha. maybe honestly, who knows, maybe, maybe after I do a couple of months in Turkey and maybe get a little bit more exposure to, um, kind of like middle Eastern culture, if you will, if, um, you know, if I feel like it's not like too cult culturally overwhelming or whatever, maybe, you know, I'll, I'll make my way out to Dubai. It'd be beautiful there. I actually have a couple connections who are out there in the crypto space who moved out, uh, right. relatively recently and they speak very highly of it. And, um, funny yeah. enough, I even met with a, a subscriber here in Budapest last night for the second time. And we grabbed some drinks together. Um, and you know, he was just telling me that it's, it's an amazing experience out there in Dubai. So, you know, I'll definitely, it's on my list. hundred percent. We got a friend out there too, uh, crypto Archie. So if you're going out there, we'll make sure to connect you to in Dubai. Yeah, that'd so. be great. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Well, everybody, it is time to wrap up today's stream. A couple of announcements before I go. You can go to my full screen here, not my, my full face here, uh, Piper. So next week's going to be very interesting. I'm going to be down in Miami the whole week for the Bitcoin conference. I will be driving on Monday, so I will not be here for Monday's show. And I believe Piper is going on vacation. So we're so happy for him and his wife. Get a good getaway. So that means T-Shroom. We'll probably find a guest for him, or maybe he's running solo on Monday. But I should be able to join him on uh, you know Tuesday, Wednesday. Wednesday, Thursday, so the show will be normal. And then Friday next week, more than likely, we will not have a show. Uh, T Shroom has drill, uh, and I will be wrapping up and starting to head back from, uh, well, I'm wrapping up my trip down there in Miami as the conference is going live. However, we will still be going as much as possible full fledged next week. Also, make sure tomorrow, put it on your calendar, Mr. Army Piper is living his crypto dream. He will be appearing for the first time on Around the Blockchain. Tomorrow night at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So please, every single bro, go show support. Do the plus a billions for Army Piper tomorrow night. It is going to be awesome. I know he's going to kill it. And Investing Bros is going to be represented extremely well. Pretty soon they're going to call it Around the Bros because that's how much we dominate it is my nice. plan. With that said, though, you guys, that is all we have for you in this show. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow morning. Same time, same place. Love you guys. See you tomorrow. Make paper, turn that better than cake. Money like Lego, connect the dots that bank. We are investing bros. We are investing bros. Investing bros. Army pipe, lethal on trade. Entries and exits, worthy of praise. Tim, the professor of the TA. Shout it out loud on the PA. Teach rooms news, catch a word. Doing better than what he deserves. Beamer, leave no evidence. Soon fly coop with his dividend. Huh? Trying to make paper. Turn that better than cake. Money like Lego. Connect the dots that bank. We are investing bros. We are investing bros. Investing bros.